yeah, this is going to be a little bit different from what we've just seen. Um, so you may be wondering, OK, why the atmosphere of Venus? Venus is supposed to be pretty much totally inhospitable, right? Well, it is. The surface definitely is. But the upper atmosphere is actually relatively Earth-like. At about 51 to 57 kilometers above the surface, you've got about temperatures between 30 and 80 degrees Celsius. So on the warm side, but definitely still within habitable range. And the pressure varies from about uh, one-tenth of the Earth's atmosphere to almost a full Earth's atmosphere normal pressure. Um, you also have detectable quantities of nitrogen, usually either in the form of nitrogen gas or an unknown but potentially very large amount of nitrous oxide produced by lightning activity. And also phosphorus in the form of phosphoric acid, both of those have, um, which is, came from, I think, the Vega missions. Um, you also have a lot of different possible sources of energy, either sunlight or the redox gradients um, between various oxidized and reduced sulfur and um, also oxidized and reduced carbon compounds as well, which is kind of set up by the really complex Venetian ap uh, atmospheric chemistry. And also, from a historical point of view, it's thought based on the deuterium hydrogen ratios that Venus probably had in ocean early on in its history, which may have been a good location for microbes to evolve and then eventually or at least potentially um, adapt and colonize the atmosphere as the planet became less hospitable. So we decided to try to test this idea. Um, built it using XPP Aught, which is a nice, small, free little package for um, modeling differential equations. Uh, the initial parameters for the atmosphere were based on remote sensing observations, mostly from either Pioneer Venus or from Vega, as well as a little bit from Venus Express, but mostly the older missions. The initial parameters for our hypothetical microbes were based on values taken from terrestrial thermophile and acidophile bacteria, so Theomicrospira, um, sulfactotum bacteria, I can never pronounce them correctly, uh, but you know, existing and in some cases fairly well characterized terrestrial bacteria that would survive in a warm acidic environment. Uh, so I am an ecologist. I am not an atmospheric chemist, which meant I made a load of assumptions in building this model just to get it simple enough that I could actually manage it. Uh, first off, the atmospheric chemistry was hugely simplified. We assumed a global uniform distribution, so we're not taking regional variations into account. Uh, it's steady, steady state. Um, so we're assuming one of the weird things about the Venetian atmosphere is they've been noticing a decline in sulfur dioxide. Um, but we're assuming that's being replenished probably by volcanic activity. Um, and we're ignoring the hundreds and hundreds of potential side reactions and focusing only on about three or four major reactions for the purposes of our model. The microbial growth is based on the Monod equation, which is a variation on, on the kalis minton kinetics, um, in which case you, the growth rate mu is, let's see here, is that better? There we go. The growth rate mu is derived from mu max, which is the uh, maximum growth rate, which is usually empirically obtained, uh, times the substrate, um, whatever the organism needs to grow on, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, divided by the half saturation constant, which is another empirically observed value, um, then again, plus the amount of sub the concentration of substrate. And the whole model for the interactions is based on stoichiometric um, relationships, specifically the Redfield ratio. Uh, so basically, it was assumed that the bacteria to grow um, would take 106 carbon, 16 nitrogen, and one phosphorus in that ratio um, in order to grow and continue existing. And therefore, if there was more carbon that than the ratio allowed, it would just be ignored. It would not be taken up as biomass. Uh, and then for sort of, I guess, the metabolic part of the cycle, we've got two major metabolic reactions um, by two different microbial populations. The first one is a photosynthetic reaction uh, in which it's the phototrophic oxidation of hydrogen sulfide to elemental sulfur um, or other forms of amorphous sulfur. And the other, one, other half of it is um, the reduction of sulfur dioxide back to hydrogen sulfide. 
Um, and the nice thing about the phototrophic reaction is it also gives you a potential way to manufacture water, which is fairly scarce in the Venetian atmosphere. Um, so here's just some of the initial parameters. Like I said, these came from mostly remote sensing data. In some cases, they came from other people's models as well. Um, and I will explain how all these numbers work together shortly. Um, and here's the, give you an idea of the initial parameters of the microbes. Like I said, mostly based off of um, known thermophiles or acidophiles. In some cases, for example, a lot of the um, half saturation constants there have not been characterized for a lot of bacteria. So based off of bacteria, it has been characterized. We essentially assume that it, the half saturation constant for nitrogen is going to be on an order of magnitude lower than the half saturation constant for carbon, and the half saturation constant of phosphorus is going to be in order of magnitude lower than that. Um, so this is sort of like the very prettified um, view of the model structurally. So essentially for nutrients, which are in this case carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, you're cycled between an inorganic form and a or, um, biologically available form that's been taken up by the biomass. So if it, the biomass grows, it takes up the inorganic form, and then when it dies, it, that form is then released and presumably oxidized back to an inorganic form. Um, the growth rate is dependent on, or well, the growth is dependent on the growth rate of the microbes, which is dependent on nutrient availability. The death rate, however, is fixed. It's assumed that based off of the atmospheric dynamics of Venus that your average bacteria is going to be aloft for about three months um, before it drops into the lower atmosphere. And here's the metabolism cycle, which, like I said, is a lot simpler, and we're ignoring a lot of potential chemistry. Um, so basically, you have hydrogen sulfide, which is photosynthetically oxidized, or rather, oh, wow, these two are switched. Uh, no, wait, no, no, that's right. Yeah, it's photosynthetically oxidized. No, these two are switched. Never mind, my mistake. OK, um, this actually should go backwards. You have um, hydrogen sulfide, which is oxidized into amorphous sulfur, which then undergoes a photolytic reaction, which splits it. It reacts with um, other oxygen-bearing compounds, which usually have also been photosynthetic, uh, photolithically split, and forms sulfur dioxide, which is then reduced by hydrogen sulfide. Sorry about that. Um, so here's the results. I don't have any pretty graphs for you, partially because XPP Aut has a very clunky graph interface, but also because it reaches equilibrium really quickly, so it would have just been a bunch of straight lines. Um, so, and we're just kind of measuring it against um, what observed values are, for the most part, when they're available. So um, we got about 1.9 uh, micromoles per liter of atmosphere for biomass carbon. Um, so I guess that's kind of probably would be an upper bound, very, very rough estimate for how much biomass you could sustain. And then you've got 0.29 and 0.06 micromole liters of nitrogen and phosphorus, which are, um, again, limited by the Redfield ratio. Uh, the inorganic nitrogen really didn't change at all just because there's so much of it compared to the amount of biomass. The inorganic phosphorus was depleted, um, which isn't too surprising given that on Earth, and presumably in the system as well, phosphorus is usually the new, um, limiting nutrient, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. The sulfur dioxide was enriched, and correspondingly, the uh, hydrogen sulfide was depleted. Um, and also, there was a lot more amorphous sulfur generated than um, has been measured so far, which is an odd result. Um, so just to talk about a little bit more, like I said, phosphorus is probably the limiting nutrient, or actually, at least in the modeled system, is definitely the limiting nutrient. If you increase the initial uh, inorganic phosphorus available from 0 0.051 to 0 0.07, it pretty much doubles the amount of biomass. So very small changes will result in a major change in the amount of biomass. Um, again, much larger quantities of morphous sulfur were produced than observed, assuming that the model is even somewhat resemblant of reality. Um, that raises the question of why haven't we observed more? And there are a couple different ways or that you might be getting rid of it as a sink. 
Um, abiotically, there are a couple of abiotic pro uh, processes. Again, photolytic reactions or photochemical reactions. Um, there are a bunch I didn't, wasn't able to take into account, although most of them have very low reaction rates, so that's probably not too likely. A more likely explanation might be nucleation, that is they clump together and form aerosols, which can then either drop out of the atmosphere um, or simply aren't detected by instrumentation. Uh, there could be a faster mechanism of conversion to sulfur dioxide. And also one of the more interesting hypotheses is that, um, is that uh, Schultz and McCoo and colleagues 2004 speculated that some of the absorption features they've seen in the Venetian atmosphere was actually the result of cyclooctosulfate, which is a very effective UV protectant um, and is relatively easy to synthesize in the Venetian atmosphere, and that bacteria might have actually been generating it and sequestering the amorphous sulfur to essentially um, mitigate against UV damage, which, given Venus's lack of an ozone layer, would be something you would have to worry about. So that would make sense. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, so yeah, there theoretically is enough hydrogen or enough nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon for a microbe like a terrestrial acidophile, thermophile, thermophile to um, survive on the in the Venetian atmosphere. We've got, like I said, a small but plausible estimate for the amount of biomass that is supported. Um, but like I said, the conversion of amorphous sulfur to sulfur dioxide is still really poorly characterized, and that's probably one of the biggest weaknesses in the model. Ways to solve that would be, again, um, addressing the complex atmospheric chemistry, because as I mentioned earlier, there are hundreds of reactions, some of which are probably going to be more relevant than others, but I'm, the next phase is to start slowly including those and seeing how it affects the model. And in particular, um, there's also a whole set of reactions involving carbon monoxide and the formation of carbonyl sulfide, which also may be very relevant to biological systems. So, uh, without further ado, any questions? This may be a relatively simple question for you uh, as an ecologist, but uh, how do these uh, biomasses compare to what we might find in a terrestrial system? Oh, they're incredibly low. Okay. Um, your average plot of like woodland forest had something like, I think it was 600 micromoles of carbon per liter, something like that. You know, it's very, very low compared to all but the most marginal terrestrial environments. Thanks. This probably might not be able to be answered, but I was just, something to think about might be the time scales for reproduction for these organisms versus the time scales to fall out of the atmosphere. Yeah, that's actually something that. I left as kind of an open question, but that is actually going to be a, a major part of it. And I think another thing I would want to, um, for the, I guess, next phase, since this is, again, a very preliminary approximate model, um, is to actually start to include that and actually look at again, what terrestrial bacteria under similar environments, what their, their usual reproductive rate like, because that's going to make a huge difference on how fast this stuff is going to grow and how long it's going to be able to persist in the atmosphere. I got another probably really quick one. Um, you said this was based off of uh, thermophiles and acidophile mm -hmm. um, organisms here. Are those um, in, present in the Earth's atmosphere? Oh, no. These, they're, uh, some of them are, most of them either come from hot springs or from um, hydrothermal vents, which admittedly is a big change in environment, but unfortunately we don't, there, but that's about the closest we have to a analogous environment to something like the Venetian atmosphere. Oh, okay, I see. So Thank you. Ideally, if we could find a really weirdly acidic desert, that would be perfect, but I don't know if there are many of those around. Okay, let's thank our speakers and all the speakers of that session again.